What is up, everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Daily Hi Fi podcast. My name is Chana. As as always with me, we've got Michael and Joe. <laughs> and today we've got Phil from Yamaha. What is going on, everybody? Hey, what's going on, Chana? How's hey, going, Phil. So good to have How's you, man. Going? Yeah, it's good to be here again. Yeah. What's up? Had a great time with Phil a while back in our last quarter of the Hi Fi Summit. That's so right. Today it's yeah. exciting to have him from Yamaha to come in and just share about their products and just some exciting stuff that's happening in the industry. So, yeah, well, we, we we voided the warranty on a seven thousand dollar <laughs> amplifier by yeah. getting inside. <laughs> <Right>. Yeah, <laughs> right. Right. So that was awesome. Right. Was a beautiful unit. I thought it was super intriguing how not only you showed us like the the topology and kind of the thought process and yeah. even just how you wire everything and how you place everything. There was just so much intentionality on that integrated amplifier. Yeah. And even on the yeah. bottom, like there was so much thought in the bottom side of it. So that was really cool. So definitely appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah. That's what, that's what wow. it takes to build that yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Super fascinating stuff. And, and I'm, and I'm very impressed, Phil, you went out, and did a couple of upgrades. Got a new mic. Yeah, new man. Mic. Uh, everything's sound sounding much better for the streams. He's looking that's professional. Always, that's uh, that's always good to see. Oh, you know? it's from it's from watching you guys. That's where I learn everything. Ah. Well, the good thing is, like, you can <laughs> use all of that equipment for your own purposes and for Yamaha and you know your meetings and everything. And they're gonna be like, well, then the people that you're corresponding with, they're gonna be like, man, we got to step up our game because they're like, Phil's in Phil, HD Phil's over there. <laughs> well, that's what. I see you guys all wear. I had to put headphones on, so we had to yeah. make that work. Just so, yeah. Now, granted, out. his headphones aren't plugged in anything. He's just, you know, he's just looking the part. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many Zoom meetings have you been in since all this started? Oh my God, that's yeah. just. I mean, that that's how we work now. So it's yeah. uh, four to six to eight. Yeah. Always on. A day. Yeah, and it's uh, the first. Uh, couple months was funny because it seemed like every Friday my phone calls would go down, my traffic would go down, and I'm going, how can I get so much done on a Friday? And then I realized, oh, everyone's taking the day off or something. <laughs> but then all of a sudden, you know, and then a month or two later, everyone figured out, oh, the only open spots on the calendars now are Fridays. So now we book meetings like pretty much all day Friday. Oh, so wow. <laughs> no I, escaping I anymore. So I'm going to be taking notes here, Phil. So if you see me over here looking like I'm on my phone, it's because I'm taking notes <laughs> of all the different topics because we do cut these up and mm -hmm. make them into smaller bite-sized type of uh, okay, you know, sure. easier because some people don't have an hour, hour and a half to digest this whole thing. So we yeah. break it up. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, Michael uh, yeah. is probably going to announce who's in the chat. We have Absolutely. some regulars here and, and Chana will be in charge of uh, – making sure to bring some of the funny comments up on the screen, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. That's how so it works. As, as always, we got our early crowd, man, which was like Kanga and Optimus, SI Services. They were here like an hour earlier. Just <laughs> chat, they, out. they got here before <laughs> Phil showed up. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that, 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 that's some dedication. Guys. They were here, I think, before I even logged in, man. And I was here an hour ago, so it was pretty funny. But glad to have you guys. Let's see who else we've got. Neil Hansen is in the house. Tristan, of course. Yeah. Who else we got? Legendary Brown Note. Yeah. Some new people here. Architect of Zion's in here. Rick's Miguel's back in here. Yeah. Rick. Very cool. Rockers. Good to see you guys, man. It's going to be a good night. That's I bright. see a mic back there. Phil, what is that? Uh, is that a like a calibrated mic? Oh, you know, yeah. Is that thing over there or what? Yeah. Oh, over there. Yeah, that's my uh, DSP. For, uh, just for the REW software. Yeah. Just playing around mm -hmm. with that. This is actually my two-channel room normally. Oh, but now it's my office, so now it's all jacked up with everything in the world. So, so what um, do you know? What, what are you, you rocking? Rock in there, yeah. What are you rocking? Two channel. Uh, I got a set of Westlake uh, LC three B tens. So it's an older set of uh, Westlake monitor okay. uh, speakers. Um, they image like crazy. I mean, you don't even have to take them out of the box, and all of a sudden you got pinpoint imaging on it. But it's. Uh, the way my room's getting filled with furniture, the bass is just going all over the place right now. So I've um, <laughs> been playing around with placement. And then, of course, when we do these events or when we videotape inside receivers and stuff, I have to move everything back and around. So mm -hmm. all right. just playing around with it. Well, that, that that's actually leads into something good. I had a question from uh, someone on Reddit on Budget Audio File. They mm -hmm. asked, I told them that you'd be on, and they said, uh, you know, I'm kind of curious if you're using a two channel Yamaha setup, uh, what would you recommend as a way to, to integrate, you know, a subwoofer 
with that setup. So like, for example, right now I have the AS, uh, Yamaha AS501. Mm-hmm. What would be your recommendation as far as I want to add more bass? How do I do it? Uh, depending on which subwoofer you're going with, I mean, you always got the speaker wire connection that's going with that. Some of the integrateds do have um, uh, subwoofer out, and that's becoming more common because that's more people are using that. But I, I have a bunch of older stuff, so it's when I do subs and it's typically wired over there is, mm-hmm. is the way we do that. Yeah, mine does have a sub out. Now, what would you say as far as bass management? You know, so I know my AVR does have, you know, room correction type uh, of stuff. Yeah. But with a two channel, I don't have that option, right? You don't have that. So you got to do it the right way. You have to do it mechanically. <laughs> uh, you know, and that's, uh, you know, and that, that's a good, uh, a good topic. So, yeah, you have to, you, the sub has to be positioned right in the room. Um not where it looks the coolest and probably not where it's the most convenient more, more times than not. Um, your speakers have to be out. Um, you know, and then for two channel stuff, you know, there's, there's third party EQs and, and things like that. I, I think Joe, I think you've uh, reviewed some of that stuff uh, before uh, where you can add that, where you really need that. The, the first thing you need to do and the hardest part is to get the room set up properly. Uh, with bass traps, with, uh, you know, not, not even bass traps, but you, you can get, you can go that far. Any kind of acoustic treatment. Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything like that. Get everything uh, where you want it to be. And get everything out in the open. One of the problems with two channel, uh, it's not really a problem, it's just a, a fact, is you need a bigger room typically than you need with home theater. I can get by with a fairly small home theater room. But I'm going two channel. Uh, I need a little more space because I need to bring the stuff out away from the wall. I need to bring it in from the sides to to try to reduce uh, some of that going on. Right. But um, you have to do that first. Get the speaker mechanically set in the room uh, as best as you possibly can before you even consider uh, equalization. You know, and, and any type of uh, DSP processing that's in there. And there's there's a lot of good products that are out there, aftermarket products for two channel stuff. Uh, that works really well, but don't use that as your primary way of getting awesome audio. Get the audio right first. Um, you know, we have a set of speakers we'll probably be talking about at the next Hi-Fi Summit. Um, and uh, placement on them is real finicky. Really? Yeah. Um, so what are they, electrostats? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well, no, I, I think I think Sean, you heard them at uh, at uh, CES that one. Year. Oh, oh, like two years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, those things are nice. Yeah, but um, to get them to just open up and explode is very it's time consuming. It, it takes us a couple hours, and I set it up in the same demo room, so I kind of have a way I know the general location. But we're doing um, quarter inch twists with the uh, speaker stand. We're moving it forward th- mm-hmm. two inches. We're moving yeah. it back a half inch. And it's it gets down where, man, that sounds really good. It sounds really good. But if you stick with it for another half hour and you just yeah. go a little bit forward, a little nice. bit back, toe in, toe out, all of a sudden it just pops. And then it's magical. It's, it's just unbelievable. And that's the way good speakers are. Uh, because you're dealing, there's such high level physics to get two speakers yeah. to sound three dimensional. You know, everyone thinks just ah, throw some speakers up there and you know, crank it up and do a little, turn the bass up and it, it's going to work. Uh, it is so dependent on room that um, yeah. it's just it's it's actually an art form to do that. I'm not a master at it. I've seen masters do it, uh, so I kind of steal some of their ideas. But once we get uh, get it set up in the room, then we can start messing around with EQ and. Uh, it, Fixing that base up, you know, if we can't, if we, yeah, if we can't fix it mechanically, then you got to go in and start doing it electronically. Got and that's it. why, yeah, and that's why uh, calibration is so important, uh, you know, especially for entry level receivers or mid level receivers or AV receivers in general, because if you try to set up a seven point two channel system mm-hmm. and get everything mechanically set. Uh, You'll never have time for a couple of days, right? Yeah, I'll be trying to upgrade your equipment before you hear your first movie. (laughs) (laughs) It's going to take a long time. So, uh, practically, uh, you need to have uh, some type of EQ 
you know, like Yamaha Y Power and Odyssey or something like that for the multi-channel stuff because it's just there's so much going on in the room. It's it's almost impossible to do it. So uh, that's how you say it. Why pow? Why pow? Why pow? All right. So let's talk about why pow. <laughs> um, you know, I've had an experience with it a while back on an older receiver. I mm. think I just I haven't tried any of the new stuff, right? So I'm excited to try some new stuff because mm. people always ask, like, you know, what do you think of this? I'm like, I don't know. I haven't. I don't know about it. <laughs> I don't know I about got, Yamaha. I know, stuff. I know, I know. You're gonna get your receivers. <laughs> so yeah, that's yeah. that's. Uh, I'm kind of curious about uh, your room correction. What do you guys call it? Room correction or? Uh, yeah, it's why uh, it's room calibration. So it's room calibration. Yamaha Yamaha Parametric Acoustic Optimizer. Oh, <laughs> Phil, there you get an A, buddy. You get oh, an A. Oh wow, he passes. Yes. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. So maybe what what does that, like how does YPAL like how does that differentiate say, differentiate itself from say Odyssey or <laughs> um, some of the other you know room uh, correct? What do you try to do? S- there's similarities and differences. Um, it's always evolving. Uh, we our first product with YPAL was in 2004. Okay. And so we've been working on this uh, for quite a while, and it mm-hmm. keeps improving. And now we're doing 64-bit processing on the high-end receivers and uh, just tons. I mean, it's not even close to what it was when we started. But with Yamaha, one of the things that um, that works with our YPOW, since it's our coding and our software, and then we write the coding and the software for all the DSP processing chips that are in there. You know, because Yamaha is famous for their sound field processing, you know, the concert mm-hmm. halls and jazz clubs for music. Um, our YPOW, uh, one of the things it does is uh, YPOW volume. And so that's that's a loudness EQ that goes, that is in there. So when you turn the volume down, you know how the bass and the treble just roll off and you're stuck mm-hmm. with mid-range. I, I think all you know the other calibration things have this uh, type of thing. Um, but one of the things, you're familiar with the loudness curve, right? So Yeah, equal loudness contour curve. Yeah. The, yeah. the, the Fletcher Munson curve. Fletcher. Fletcher and Munson. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, so at low levels, our ears are sensitive to those things. So when we turn the volume down, then we add a, you know, an EQ to it. So it sounds like it's flat at low yeah. level. Well, one of the things that we do is when we do our YPOW measurement, when we're measuring your room and reflections and all that, uh, we also, one of the data points we're picking up is uh, your speaker efficiency. You can't just put a loudness contour and connect it to the volume control. So at the nine o'clock position, it has this curve. And at the 10 mm-hmm. o'clock position, it has this curve. At 12, yeah. it's flat. Because if I'm running a set of clips that are 106 yeah. dB, mm-hmm. the nine o'clock position might be blowing my windows <laughs> off. I, you know, I don't want any, yeah, any right. yeah. uh, EQ on that. Sure. And then when you, if you're using something inefficient, you got to crank the volume up. So it That's pretty cool. Yeah, it measures room, uh, and that's tied to the volume. And that's a very practical thing. And once you, if you don't use loudness control, once it's done right, you you won't use it any other way. Because hmm. even at at night, you can still hear everything. Mm-hmm. Um, we tie our YPOW into uh, since we're when we're doing the calibration, we know how bright the room is because we're we're hearing the reflections and the subsequent reverberations. We're able to measure all that. So we know that if you have a really bright room with a lot of reflective surfaces, then your room can use more DSP processing. So if I go to the jazz club and put put it in uh, the, the bottom line in New York City, if I select that mode right there, uh, if I put it in there, uh, I can put more DSP processing onto the music in a bright room will handle more reflections and reverberations because it's naturally light. It's kind of backwards from what you think. If I have a real dead room or a real uh, tight room, I don't need hardly any DSP processing to give me that same effect. And so our YPOW goes, okay, speakers are real inefficient. Uh, so we'll take the processing that direction to control that. For DSP, uh, we're gonna uh, adaptive DSP. We'll take care of that. Um, it's a bright room. So we're gonna add a little bit extra DSP or it's a dead room. We're gonna do a lot. Mm-hmm. So it's part of everything. It's not just, uh, loudness and placement and delays and things like that. It's it kind of has its tentacles into all the programming for all the audio that's that's being done in there. 
And you were saying, and you were saying that it has changed. So I think a lot of people who have had experience, maybe I know for myself, I've had experience with the old version that didn't. I don't think it did any of that stuff that you just said right now. <laughs> I think it yeah. was just like level <laughs> matching. So uh, if that was your experience, maybe you might think like, ah, oh, well, I don't like Yamaha for mm. AVRs because they suck. Mm -hmm. You know, their Wipeout sucks. I've tried it. Well, it might not be the same, right? And right. that's why I'm curious yeah. to see the new stuff. Uh, but you know, when it comes to two channel stuff. People love it. It's just when it comes to AVRs, people are just, I don't know that they know enough about it. Yeah. Uh, you can actually go up. I, I forgot to mention this. Um, the AS803 is uh, integrated uh, to channel. You have, the, you have the 503, right? 501. <laughs> 501. Okay. Uh, there's the model that's the next one up. Uh, it has USB DAC function built into it. So it does have some digital in there. Yours is purely audio, uh, you know, just analog audio. Analog. Get it out. Yeah, and keep it nice and clean. The next model up, we wanted to build a product that was uh, for people with the USB DAC function. So um, we can, you know, pull that off our laptops and things like that. So we had to put some digital in there. Well, since we had the processing chip in there, we decided, why don't we add calibration to it? Since mm. it's our code, we don't have to yeah. rewrite it, you know, just sure. fine, fine tweak it for that. So the 803 actually has a two-channel uh, calibration uh, in it to go along with the... Oh, crazy. Cool. I didn't know that. There you go. Yeah. I thought it just had more power. Look, yep, there's, there's a mic. mic going on. There's, there's the mic. mic. You better send mine back. <laughs> actually, uh, speaking about the mic, Jeff's got a good question here. He says, is it proper to only use the YPAL mic to calibrate yes. and not use an aftermarket, like maybe a, a UMIC one or something like that? Yep. Yeah. Um, the microphone uh, preamp that's inside the unit is built for that mic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, gotcha. that's like that's matched cool. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Not every microphone. And you look at it and it's, it's not very heavy. It's, it's mm -hmm. a plastic case. And it's like, ah, how good can this be? Uh, the key, it just has to be consistent. Mm -hmm. If we know that this mic does this, sure. You know, for the 10,000 units that we're going to make, gotcha. then we just EQ the microphone preamp inside to compensate mm -hmm. for that. And, you know, we get in a, um, you know, we have problems sometime uh, if you're using the wrong mic. You might not have this problem, but I have a drawer full of microphones. I have one at my desk. I have no, one here I, in my I have that problem from yeah. generation to generation. And I pull I, it out and I go, oh, I'm not sure to, if that's the right mark on, Need to write on them or something to put a yeah, code. So you, yeah, you pull out another box and, uh, and, and do it again because the preamp needs to know what the amplifier is doing. It's easier with uh, calibrated mics, you know, and we're using software because then we can just put a calibration file in. correction file in there and then it, it takes care of it. Nice. Two cool. Channels. Definitely got some other questions in here if we can kind of keep going along that line. Um, says Phil, uh, regular guy audio says, Phil, do you work with mixing engineers to help dial in acoustic curves for modern mixes? Uh, no, I don't. I work <laughs> next to the guys that do, and that is a, that's a whole world under itself. I mean, that's a whole new I, world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think this part ties into it as well, seeing as how Yamaha not only makes instruments, but also supporting equipment yep. as well. I'd assume there would be interdepartmental collaboration. So do they kind of intermix and help each other out in those different departments? As a matter of fact, we do. Uh, oh. In Japan, we have a, um, a team of guys, and they're from all different. They're from pro audio, uh, musical instruments, AV equipment, um, the mixing boards, uh, the PA stuff. Uh, it's a group of guys that are the uh, God. I don't even know what I don't even know what their title is. Uh, they voice everything, or mm. they they give the thumbs up or thumbs down. So if sure. I'm in the AV division and I'm building an amplifier and I, we know how we like it because we're really yeah, good like at it. We've been doing it a long time, but yeah, it, it'd be something like it, but it's, it's a group. It's a, it's a group of guys. And it's sound not a very sensei. big group. sound sensei. I think above, above the sensei. Uh, oh, more oh, the the master. <laughs> Mr. Miyagi. And so they will go and, you know, our AV guys or our hi-fi guys, you know, we're good. You know, we've been doing it a long time, so mm -hmm. we know what stuff, but the stuff doesn't get released until it gets auditioned by the guys with the the golden ears guys and mm -hmm. then they're they're cross function cross product uh many have been around for a long long time it's uh there's a few younger guys in there but for the most part it's guys that have been doing this forever so yeah. um we we make outdoor speakers and yep. those get those get sound tuned or uh they have to be approved by the 
pro audio speaker guys. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a whole completely different sound thing, but they still, they know what we're going for. Oh. They want to listen to it because uh, the entire group, it, it's Yamaha. You know, it's, it's everything we put out has to support everything else. You know, our $150,000 pianos uh, have to sound pretty darn good when we're playing it back through an AV receiver. It has to sound good when it comes to a sound bar. Now, it's not we, you know, quite the level, you know, yeah. when, when you go up to high end two channel, but there's still the principles there of, sure. of what it needs to sound like. So do they do they get like the piano guy, like the guy who made the piano, like, hey, come here, check out this recording. Does it sound right? No. All right. Fix the amp then. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, get the motorcycle. Come here. Yeah, yeah. How about the that motorcycle? Right? Did they do motorcycle sounds too? Does that sound right? <laughs> yeah, you guys the, make uh, everything. Oh god, what's uh? You guys need to make mics too. Do you guys make mics? That's one thing we don't make. That's one hmm. thing uh, we had we had made those in the past, but that is a specialized yeah, you know, a Kai thing. <laughs> oh okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you know the model number. I mean, there's certain model numbers that have been used for you know for 40 years, and those are the ones that singers use. There you go. <laughs> yeah. SM7B is pretty popular. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So I, ha I have a kind of a serious question for you. Are you ready? Get it. Okay. Here so it the is. question is, the question is, do you ever get tired of eating Brazilian barbecue? <laughs> <laughs> That's from Alex, isn't it? <laughs> no, that was, uh, uh, I, I had to call Phil Jones real quick oh, did he? right before. Say, <laughs> hey, what, 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 what can I ask this guy? It's going to throw him oh, off his game man, a little bit. Funny. Hey, Phil, if you're on, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> no, that's kind of our signature dish for our uh, marketing department is uh, our director is Brazilian uh, or is half Brazilian. So he turned us on to Chabascarias and What's interesting, it, well, I don't know if it's interesting, but it's a fact. <laughs> in Hamamatsu, Japan, uh, uh, is one of the biggest populations of Brazilians uh, outside of Brazil. Brazil, huh. Yeah, and so there's a lot of uh, Brazilian barbecue in uh, Hamamatsu, in the region where we go. So we actually, when we go there, usually one night we'll have Brazil, <laughs> Brazilian in <laughs> Japan. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah, I'm actually getting hungry, so we, we should maybe move on from that. <laughs> yeah, move on from that topic. Yeah. I got a question here from Jeff. It says, is it true that the RX V8 8K receiver will be 0.06%? Much cleaner, you know, I guess maybe will that be much cleaner than his RX V381? Uh, off the top of my head, that your 381 might be 0.8, maybe. I, I'd have to look that up, uh, but... At those levels, believe it or not, it looks like, okay, this is 0 0.06 and this is 0 0.01. Yeah. It's um, like how much in here. Yeah. It, 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 it's, so, it's so minuscule when it gets down to that. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's been uh, studies. I think 1%, one, 1 I think, is what you can hear. Uh, right. It's, it's actually, I, I don't remember the number, but I, I know there's, there's been testing and research done on that. Mm -hmm. So the percentage is much higher. Uh, one thing that, um, uh, the residual noise, that's probably the most important thing. Because uh, if you plug your amp in and put your ear up next to the speaker, you know, with, with the volume turned up, yeah. no input signal. <laughs> um, and if you're hearing it, mm -hmm. you know, you're hearing that that's electronic, that's the transistors, that's capacitors, that's all that. So that right. noise, uh, that's one way you can tell the difference in quality between product. You can't fake that, mm -hmm. uh, the residual noise. Distortion, you can cheat. Uh, the specs because I can add more feedback. Uh, I can add more feedback at 1K or wherever I want to measure it and I can change the bandwidth. Uh, distortion is a little bit misleading. That should, probably shouldn't be your, your number one thing. Gotcha. Uh, but residual noise, it has to be designed right. It has to have good components in there for that noise floor to come down. So um, you're going to see most everything has pretty good distortion, you know, in the industry in general. In general, right? yeah. Um, but uh, there's different grades of electronics still in circuitry. Oh, for sure. Makes that's sense. interesting. You, you talk about uh, the hiss because that's one of my pet peeves. Like I have some studio monitors. I know you guys make some very popular yeah. studio monitors. I need to check out, check them out. I haven't actually tried them out, but I've reviewed some and I hate the hiss because it's right here at my desk. It's yeah. quiet at it's night. Your, it's right and, there. And right there it's in your right face. Right there. 
and the thing about studio monitors, they're typically turned all the way up. You know what I mean? Yep. Because you're changing yep. the volume on your interface, yep. right? So you want them up pretty loud for the most part. And if there's hiss, it's almost like, no, nope, these, I don't care yeah, how they even sound. Like, get, them, get them out of here. <laughs> yeah, it, it ruins the whole thing. It really does. But yeah, you guys, um, you know, I have a, <laughs> um, a Parasound app that I use and it's a power app. So it's, you know, yeah. it's always, you put your ear to that thing, you don't hear anything. There's nothing there, right? Right. And same thing with this uh, this Yamaha, quiet. And that's what I really like. That's what people should really look for is see how quiet your amp is. Mm -hmm. You know, see how low that noise floor is. It's very important. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, one of the things, you know, and that's kind of a balancing thing too. You know, uh, the RXV381 is a, a 299, uh, 249 uh, surround receiver. receiver, a little five channel receiver. Well, that's not going to go with this typically with a set of, you know, two thousand dollars surround speakers. You know, you're not going to have a two thousand dollars speaker package with a, a two hundred fifty dollars. So you're probably going to have bookshelves. They're probably going to be less efficient um, type of thing. So kind of the categories of product uh, are made to work with other products in that price that, range. Kind of in that ish. price range. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah ish. Uh, so you can kind of get by. Um, <clears throat> you, can, you can have more noise on an entry level receiver than you're going to have on our thirty five hundred dollar receiver. Just because the, the internal components, yeah, yeah, the caliber of products that's going to be plugged into, uh, you're going to be putting it into a room that has uh, acoustic treatment and things like that when you have high end products. So then it becomes even more uh, important uh, to control any residual noise at all. Can we talk about why this app is so good? Because it's you know it's well regarded. Uh, you know, it's not the most expensive two channel nope. app, and people like you know I talk to. Folks who who take apart old receivers, and I talk about this one, they're like, yeah, that's one of the new ones that's built like one of the old ones, is kind of what they've said. I'm not in, I don't know about all that, so I can't speak as to like, oh, this has this and that, yeah. but that's what I've heard. Yeah, and um, it has to do with everything. I mean, everything interacts with everything. So it's, it's the power supply, it's the topology, it's how it's laid out. So the left channel's over here, right channel's over there. How much separation, is there different signal paths? I, we looked at that with the real high-end stuff. Yeah. But we still use as many of those principles as we can when we get down to an entry level or a mid-level uh, integrated amp. And again, it's the same guys building it. You know, it's the same teams that work on the high-end stuff, you know, eventually will rotate through and maybe the lead guy, you know, on the next entry level receiver. So now he's teaching uh, what right. he learned from this to the other guys. Mm -hmm. So that stuff, that stuff carries on. <clears throat> Two channel uh, with Yamaha. That's what put us on the market uh, back in 76 when we came with the CA 1000 as a two channel integrated. And that was kind of an integrated were the thing uh, all the way up until about home theater time, about late eighties, early nineties. Then you started seeing sales of integrators dropping down and then receivers are going up because now we had multiple channels, sure. you had more processing. Um, so there, there is a window where stereo receivers were good and a lot of people were doing those, but your next little step up was integrated. So it was really common to buy integrators and probably less common to buy uh, stereo receivers back then. Hmm. I would pay another 5,000 just for the VU meters. <laughs> I, I kid. oh goodness goodness phil got another question over here from james he says will there be in it uh, is it avantage, is that avantage yeah. okay so an avantage line with imax enhanced that's like the biggest latest greatest yep. everybody's wanting to know about imax enhanced so can you tell us something about that uh no i can't okay. oh <laughs> they're all hush hush no, over uh, uh, it looks like uh, hardware capabilities are probably uh, going to be uh, are there. Okay. It's not super rocket science with that. Sure. Okay. Um, licensing is uh, substantial mm. for IMAX. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, you know, it has to be a uh, right. sell enough got, of it because of that. Well, Atmos, you got, you've got yeah. DTSX, Dolby yeah. Vision, yeah. right? Are you guys doing HDR 10 plus on the new receivers? Yeah, yeah they'll have 10 plus, yes. Yeah. yeah, so it's, you know, the IMAX Enhance is awesome. It's spectacular. Um, you know, you got, you got to, it's a dollar thing. And the hardware uh, promises to be uh, 
capable of doing the processing. <clears throat> Just be a matter of uh, if there's a demand for it. Sure. Big enough demand to yeah. uh, justify the cost. So in regards to the licensing, is that something that Yamaha pays for a particular series or a, um, is that or just a, a one off model or model. is it, Hey, no, we've got a yeah. license to use it in all our products kind of thing. And oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> 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 He's like, no. Thinking, right? yeah. Not at all. I mean, is it a specific to individual models that you have? Yeah, to it, it, it goes uh, on volume. Uh, how many you think you're going to sell? And then it depends on what's negotiated. Okay. Uh, different licenses have different, uh, different things. Uh, yeah. Usually they're not unlimited. Um, I don't, I don't get involved with that, but sure. I been around it and, and seen what happens. And, <laughs> you know, they, they want to know, okay, if you're going to sell 600 trillion of these things, you, you know, right. it's the greatest thing better than the iPhone. Might uh, as well. They're going to want their cut. Oh, no, they don't want to cut off that joker. Yeah, sure. They don't want a one-time uh, charge on that. So. I got All you. right. I have, I have one for you. And this is uh, Michael and I were talking about this right before we went on. All right. So I want to ask you. You guys make the uh, preamps, right? The CX series. If I were to upgrade, let's say I have a AVR right now, everything's built in, right? I got my my the processor in there, and then the amplifiers in there, all in one box. If I wanted to step up and go with separates, what am I going to notice a bigger difference with? If uh, would I notice a bigger difference going with a preamplifier? Or power. Well, I guess I could say it like this. It's tough to say it in a in this way, but does the amplifier separate power amplifier make a bigger difference, or the fact that it's a separate preamplifier? Which one contributes more to the enhanced sound? Oh, I always say both. Buy, buy them both. <laughs> <laughs> and and I tell you why that. I tell you why there's a question like that, right? Because some of the some of the AVRs now Damn do have preouts, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. now it's like, should I just get a power amp, or should I? Go separate. What should I do? That's a legitimate question, and that's a good question. Um, if you're okay with video switching, see, that's one thing. You got that's the third thing. You got the, the oh, audio right. processing and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, you got the power amp, but now you got the video. Is it HDMI 2.0, 2.1, sure. whatever right. it is? If you if you're good with the video switching, um, keep your processor or use it as a pre out and start going separate power mm -hmm. amps and. Uh, I like going multiple power amps, you know, don't get a five channel, seven channel, 11 channel. Uh, for our trade shows, we use two 11 channel amps um, to run our little theater. You know, it's a 20 by 18 foot room. And God, I don't know how much power that is. It's a couple 3000 watts of power or something like that in there. But um, if you separate it out, the, the power, the high current uh, that drives the amplifiers, that's what puts the strain on all the power supplies, on the transformers, the filter capacitors, all that stuff. Uh, it can't stay as stable when you're you know, trying to cram just tons of current out to your speakers. The processors, if we can get the load off of the receiver, you know, having seven or nine amplifiers in one box is... <laughs> it's kind of crazy. It, it, it's tough to do engineering wise because there's a lot of stuff in that single box. So right. um, we do a good job because we know, you know, what the limitations are. We can beef up this part of the power supply or uh, filter out this voltage supply for the DSP processor better. But if you can get everything outside and use the pre outs, that'd be your first step, you know, and then consider, you know, down the road, then you're going to want to upgrade the, the preamp processor because pro you're probably going to need the video you know Switching, if you're good yeah. today you're going to need some type of video processing upgrade yeah in a year or two anyway uh, so i guess to follow up would how much difference is there going to be typically if i use an avr that does have pre-outs versus a dedicated preamp pre-pro that's all it does no amplifiers inside that box what kind of difference Am I going to notice? Yeah, it's still going to get better because then now you now your power supplies are specialized. Uh, what you're going to hear, uh, it, it, there's, a, a, again, a ton of variables on this, but what you're going to hear is um, more openness. Uh, uh, I can't even explain it. Um, it's going to be more open. It's not going to be strained. It's not going to be trying to get the signal through. It's going to just... Just let it uh, pass right on through. When you have a 
the power supplies that are dedicated for DSP processing. So you got five volt supply. So you have 40 amps of five volt supply just to do the signal processing, the YPOW and the EQ and, and uh, the Atmos, whatever it happens to be. Uh, that all works in a certain voltage range. We get that all, a power supply is just for that, a monster power supply just for that. And that's what goes into these preamps. You get huge dedicated supplies. You'll have a huge supply for the digital section. Uh, you'll have a huge supply for the analog section, which is a right. completely different uh, design, and that'll be off to the side. When you're in an AV receiver, and then we actually separate supplies for the video section. We'll keep that out of the way too, because that does nothing good for sound at all. That's you know, video is bad for sound. Uh, we give that a separate supply. But when you get it all in one box with a single transformer, a single power supply that has a bunch of taps on it, it makes it more difficult. Now, modern AV receivers are miracles. I mean, they sound awesome, they're spectacular, but you start going to the next level, that's when separate start. Um, making, a difference. making a difference. Wow. Yeah. So the way that you explained it really kind of sold me on it because Michael, you were saying that you noticed more of a difference going to a pre-pro and in your last video or, mm -hmm. you know, a few videos, I don't, I don't know how, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you said that you noticed more of a difference on your pre-pro mm -hmm. and you said, well, because they're using better parts. And I was like, what parts? I want to know which parts, but <laughs> Phil just kind of explained there. Just, that's what you actually literally... said too. Better separation, yeah. all the stuff that you just described, Michael. Yeah. I think what's interesting too is that, you know, when we think of separates, you know, what I tried to explain in that video is that you have a separate processor and that does all your video processing, your audio processing separated from your amplifier. But what I think that's really interesting that you mentioned is not only do you have that, but internally inside the processor is better separation. You're separating yep, this right. power supply from this power supply and this video section from this audio section and this digital section from this analog section and that lowers that I guess like the noise or the amount of noise that can be or interesting. Interaction, yeah. interaction and everything. Yeah. yeah. I'm very cool. Wow. Yeah. Well, wow. cause I always wondered because if you're not using the amplifiers in an uh, in AVR and you're mm -hmm. just, just using it as a, a pre pro, I assume like, Oh, okay, well, it, I guess it has enough power, but you're saying it, it's not, it still not the same. Yeah, it's still not the same. Right. It's better. It's better to, that's your middle step is mm -hmm. using receivers sure. a preamp. Yeah. Absolutely. And then the third is, is go separates. Because a lot of guys wonder, you know, isn't a processor like a, a separate processor? Isn't that just a receiver where they strip the, you know, the amplifier out of it and they sell it as a processor, you know, at an expensive charge kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, I wish it was that easy. I wish it was that easy. <laughs> so that's I good did. to know that you don't do that. You know, that's, yeah. the, right, that's right, the answer. Right. Well, well, thank you for making me feel like I need to upgrade that portion. <laughs> I know. I mean, I, I hope Derek, who is on the fence about getting a pre-pro, understands now the differences. There you um, go. We're trying. We're in the chat. We're trying. Kango's trying to push okay. him onto the other side. So cool. I mean, I, now time, the, the, the one thing I use John is affiliate, affiliate links. <laughs> exactly. or, or Michael's affiliate link. Drop Somebody's it. affiliate links in the description. <laughs> Buy fun. that stuff. But um, so so that's so is that the main reason why the pre-pro actually costs a lot more? Yeah. Like they're yeah. usually starting around $2,000 ish, right? Yeah. It, Cause you, you're building everything. You're not sharing anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not sharing a chassis. So you have to mechanically engineer a chassis cause the boards are in different places. They can be spread out more. So some guy starts with a blank sheet of paper gotcha. and starts laying out. Okay. We think this circuit board is going to be about this big. So we need a place over here away from this power supply and that over there. So it's not just, Oh, here's a nice AV receiver. Let's you know rip the amps out yeah. and chuck them away because then everything's tucked you know back in the corner where it's not supposed to be. So gotcha. it, it, it's a whole different. Yeah, it's a whole Dang. different process. I know you got to check yeah, it and out, that, yeah, and, and that's why they're expensive too. I and mean, I, honestly, I had to hear it for myself because that was my thought always. I was that skeptic that says, "Hey, it's just an AVR minus the amplifier, and it's probably not going to make that much difference." And I try to go into things with an open mind, but I've got my own biases and my own, you know, thoughts. And so I went into it thinking I'm probably not going to hear. It wasn't like I was going in going, hey, man, it's going to be the latest, great. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. I went into it kind of negative, like I probably won't hear much. And it wasn't like complete night and day difference, but I was like, yeah. I hear better channel separation. Like Things are just mm -hmm. more distinct and more individualistic in each one of the channels and the Atmos channels. Yeah. And I was like, I like this now, you know, 
um, you got me excited yeah. there. So. Yeah, that, that's the problem. When you hear good stuff, it makes you want it. So as long, yeah. as, as, long as you don't listen to it, you're okay. You can live with it. As long it. as you don't listen to it, just look at it. Just look at it. <laughs> well, it's actually, it's actually the, your explanation, right? Yeah. Your explanation a lot of times is, is enough because I need to know what's going on in there. Yeah. You know? Even if I hear it, it's like, oh, maybe I'm just hearing, maybe I'm just hearing something, but it makes sense. You know, I like yeah. it when stuff makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So I got a question also, over here from Jonathan. He says, oh, I, bought a, I bought a Yamaha this round over my Denon 6700H, except no 13 channel Yamaha option. Any chance that Yamaha is going to create a 13 channel? I told you they're going to ask you. I know. It feels mm -hmm. like I don't know if I can say anything, but no we're going to throw it out there. Though. Is that maybe possible for Yamaha? Are you even considering that as maybe an option in the future? Uh, we we look at everything. Uh, to be honest, we do look at, at everything, uh, and then it, then we just have to make the judgment of is that going to fit in our line, and is it going to uh, meet the needs of our customers at enough level to build it right? Because we're going to have right. to build. You know, we still yeah. have to build our standard. Um, you know, and that's you know that's why we keep AB amplifiers in there. We haven't gone to digital amps on any of our uh, AB receivers, and I, I know the trend is moving that way just because of the, the ease of manufacture. I mean, there, there's a lot of benefits to digital, right. Space but saving we still, and all yeah, that. We, still, yeah. we still can't get the sound that that um, that we're looking for. You know, so uh, we look at, we experiment with it, we research it. Uh, we did a uh, uh, back in uh, late '90s. We built our own uh, digital two-channel amplifiers, a 500 watt per channel two-channel amp. Uh, is, a, is a separate. Uh, it was really cool looking. It was thin. Yeah, we used that for a research bed for digital amplifiers for the consumer audio side, and uh, we researched everything that was available out there, all the processing chips because you need a, a power supply processor. You need a um, power amplifier processor. There's there's all kinds of stuff. There was nothing that met anything to our level that we needed. Mm -hmm. uh, so we went ahead and built our own chips. So we developed our own uh, digital power supply chips and, and digital amplifier chips uh, to get us uh, the sound level that we wanted and get us performance that we wanted. Now, this was a uh, oh, it's about an $8,000 amplifier at the time. And scaling that down to an AV receiver, you know, that was, that was the experiment to see if we sure. first build something that we like that we love the performance of, but then can we scale that down into, you know, trickle down to other products? Sure. Uh, and it just wasn't practical at that time. And then, you know, we're using digital lamps and, you know, and the sound bars and, and things like that. And there's a lot of great digital lamps out there, but we start getting into high current stuff. You know, my pro audio guys have tons of digital lamps, you know, and they have, and you need it when you have a rack of you know 25 amps stacked on top of each other you have to go digital with that because there's you'd have to have an air conditioner the size of a semi truck to to cool a house system. yeah right totally. <laughs> totally now you don't you don't have to answer this if you don't want to okay right. but just touch your nose and give us a wink if we're getting an avantage <laughs> model in the next six weeks <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that was oh, uh, Randall. Me or him? Me, uh, me that's or him? Hilarious. <laughs> I thought that was good, Randall. Yeah. Those are hilarious. Yeah. They were going to hit that's you hard. I mean, they, yeah. yeah, I mean, so. Our crew, man, they want to know. You know, of course, they want the inside. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I want to know. I want to yeah, know. 13 know. channel, pre pro, <laughs> IMAX enhanced, HDMI 2.1 on every port. Like, you know? <laughs> Derek's in for the IMAX enhance. He says, man, when, when's that coming? <laughs> That's awesome. yeah, it's funny. Um, I got, um, I got this one guy, um, recently, I think like two days ago, got really mad about, he bought a couple of movies on Fandango now because they were IMAX enhanced. And he's like, I'm not getting the picture. The audio is all yeah. messed up. And I'm like, Oh man, I don't know. Like I only have experience with the IMAX enhanced discs, which right. there are still only a handful. Sure. You know, from what I know, um, and they sound great, but I, I I still can't speak to any of the, you know, streaming streaming efforts there. I think he and touched he, his nose right now. <laughs> he, I, he blinked. Was that a wink? I don't know. I don't know. Optimus Vader, thank you for the super chat. We truly appreciate it. Uh, 
he's got a question. Can you tell us a little bit about the Yamaha flagship NS5000? Uh, Yamaha is getting on the market of big subwoofers for home theater. Oh, are are you guys making some question big mark. subwoofers? Oh. Yamaha. I know, I know. We've talked about it. Yamaha, it's got like some really, really good subwoofers. So, yep. what do we have? Uh, uh, I don't see big sub subwoofers coming. Uh, you know, we have our what we consider big subwoofers anymore. I think fifteen hundred watts is probably pretty big, and that's our NS uh, SW one thousand is a uh, uh, 1,200, 1,500 watt uh, sub. And, you know, that's that's just kind of a, a common thing. Um, so subwoofers, uh, we have a nice selection right now, and so I don't see that growing right away. Might be something coming out next year that I'm not aware of, but uh, the line that we have, we have good, better, best, and a couple different categories uh, that seems to fit our products nicely. And he had a question about the NS5000 speakers. He might want to come back to the Hi-Fi Summit. There you go. Oh, hey, you heard it. Dun, dun, dun. Hey, I, I don't know very much about your subs. Do you have any that go down below 20 hertz? Uh, yeah, I think the uh, 1000, I think it's at 18 hertz is what it's, is what it's rated at. It's pretty competitive. And, yeah. And it's, uh, oh, it's a great, it's a great sub. We, you know, we use them in all the shows. Uh, it's just Yamaha is not a speaker company, you know, traditionally. Or say, right. Yeah. <laughs> kind I mean, of. Yeah. I mean, we made some awesome stuff over the years and we make some, uh, some good quality stuff. Uh, you know, but there's how many speaker brands are out there? How many subwoofer companies are out there right now that, you know, are, are doing their thing and, and doing it very well. So, uh, yeah, we have some great subs. Uh, yeah. Don't know of anything new coming out. Down the pipe I feel like you guys, when it, when you guys set your mind to something, you can always come out with a, there a you, go. you know, an awesome product. You know, if you want to do two channel, you guys make awesome two channel stuff. Um, this those studio monitors, you guys kill it with those. You know what I mean? So I think it just really depends where you focus. <laughs> uh, look at that little. That little uh, subwoofer right yeah, there, the YST. Nice that's funny because uh, I actually had a soundbar a long time ago where the the subwoofer was built into like the AVR piece. Art. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. The yeah, and... that thing didn't sound terrible actually. <laughs> well, that that little sub that you got right there is kind of funny. It's a uh, seventeen and eighth wide, so it fits in an equipment rack or a piece of furniture. You know that was made for equipment. This guy. <laughs> yeah, so that'll, that'll slide right into a wall unit. If it's wide enough for a receiver, it'll slide right in there. And it's, that's, that's your next upgrade, Michael, right there. <laughs> 30 of those. Forget it's really, those JTRs. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 really, really, it's, it's a cool little sub. I mean, it's not... Let's not look at that 1,000. Fantastic. Yeah, right this thing yeah. that 1,000. Let's yeah. look at it. There's your go. Mm -hmm. That would be... Is this using some servo perfect. technology there? Oh yeah, yeah. So it's all uh, we have it. I think see that YST, the advanced YST. That's Yamaha servo technology, and it's advanced, so that means it's better than the old servo technology. <laughs> better than the com competitors. <laughs> uh, but what it is, it's a, it's an electronic servo, and it's it's a combination of electronics and cabinet design. Uh, so um, the cabinet is designed as a Helmholtz resonator. So the box and the port all resonate at a, a low frequency. Uh, usually we go at like an octave below where the natural roll off of the subwoofer would be. Mm -hmm. um, so the box is tuned for a low frequency. The amplifier is tuned with the speaker at that low frequency. So, but what happens when a ported, uh, box gets close to resonance, uh, no air movement happens. So normally in the port, you know, you, you can put your hand down to a port and you can feel air coming in and out. You're not at you're not at resonance right there. When it gets down to the resonance to the very low frequency, all of a sudden air motion stops in that port. That's what that's resonance. That's a standing wave in your in your living room. Right. You know, you're trying to do room correction. It happens in these boxes right here. So what we've done is, so we've tuned a box up. Everything sounds great, as good as it possibly can. But now where the resonance is, we have what's called a negative impedance converter. So when the box stops, let's see if I can do this simply. If the box starts to resonate, it puts a lot of back pressure on the woofer itself. 
you know, because there's no air moving through the port anymore because okay. now we're at resonance and it's building up a standing wave in the port. The box becomes a sealed port. The woofer is pushing against something that's resonant. It doesn't want to move. So then the, the impedance goes way up and no current flows through and there's no air movement. So that's when things stop working. But what we did is we added an electronic servo. So when we get down to that frequency, we're actually measuring the amount of current that's going through the driver and all this stuff. But what we do, it's called a negative impedance and curve inverter. So when the impedance goes up at resonance, we actually triple the drive or quadruple the drive or 10x the power drive to the speaker. So we overcome electrically the mechanical resonance that's in, that's in the port though. So now we can drop down another octave from where we normally would have. Mm. So this uh, servo, uh, Yamaha servo technology has been around, uh, that was late late eighties we came out with that. And we've been using the products uh, over the years ever since, but it allows us to get, uh, overcome the physics of uh, mechanical resonance. You know, if not, you'd end up with a box mm. you know, huge, four feet across to get to get the same, same type of- uh, I kind of have that. <laughs> and, and that's- <laughs> And it's different from the one that's in the entry level one. Obviously, that's like under two hundred bucks, right? Because that also says servo. Yeah, that's I'm assuming it's, it's a little different. It uses that's the same not the advanced thing. servo. That's the uh, regular yeah. servo. Yeah. Yeah. It's the junior servo. But it's a <laughs> it's a patent. It's a Yamaha patented technology. When we first came out with that, I think it was eighty eight, uh, eighty seven, or something like that. Be the the YST one hundred. Uh, it was a, a mind blower at uh, shows and things like that because no one had ever heard that much bass coming out of that small of a box. And then over the years, we've just evolved it and then going into high power subs and stuff like that that we're using today. So we still like it. Very cool. Are you having a good time, by the way? I'm Myself? Yeah. Yeah, we're talking stereos, right? Okay. <laughs> just want to make sure. Another Pretty question much. here from... Uh, I may mess this up. My Lee may have messed up your name. Sorry about that. So, um, why pal needs to be able to adjust the level of your subwoofer like Odyssey. Does it adjust the level of the subwoofer ind independently? Yes. The, the subwoofer level is adjusted on all levels. Now uh, we have why pal. We have several different levels. As you go up the line, you start okay. getting more features and we get up you know to the upper level in the top couple models of uh, av receivers then we have uh, we set them up front front and back subwoofers right and left subwoofers mono subwoofers uh we can eq them individually or we can eq them uh separately uh for that so as you go up the line in the uh, rxv6 you know at 599 it just does a subwoofer eq so it just says okay let's eq this the best we can Sure. And there you go. Now on your website, I'm just kind of looking here. Do they say like what level? Like I know, you know again, like we keep going back to Odyssey because a lot of people are familiar with that. Yeah, yeah. XT, XT32. Do you kind of have that kind of tier system? Does the does the user know which version they're getting, or is it just they just says? Uh, yeah, if you look at the comparison chart, yeah, it's not really clear. Uh, okay. it, it it is. Uh, it'll say uh, why. Um, why pile with rsc that's reflected sound control okay so i see that okay, and multi-points another and multi -point is next, okay. next step up okay uh, and then we have uh the why pile angle adjustment okay. and that is super important it's it's a uh, i was hoping i had one here i don't have one out right now it's a little triangular boomerang that's think of a boomerang that with three right. deals on it uh, it goes on your tripod stand mm -hmm. and then the microphone when you do the angle adjustment you put it in position one through the on-screen hit go and it says put it in position two and position three and so by doing a triangulated measurement of all five or seven speakers in your room it knows what angle they are from the listening position so now where that becomes important is when you're doing uh, multi-channel playback or when you do a Dolby Atmos or something like that, because just because it's left channel, that doesn't mean the speaker is in the proper position. You know, right. it's supposed to be, it might be off at 45 degrees because of the couch or something there. I can't treat it the same way. I have to know where that speaker is at before I can put sound in. And then when you go to our top two models of uh, AV receivers, 
and then our separates too, they have uh, three, what we call 3D. So it's Y power 3D. So it does the angle. So it measures everything horizontally. So what angle everything is from the listing position. But then it's got a fourth position on top. So now we're measuring height. So we can tell where your Atmos speakers are, what angle they are from the listing position. That is super important because when you decode an Atmos um, bitstream, mm -hmm. And you get that helicopter sound that's got the little metadata with it that says, okay, this time code is supposed to be right here. And this time code is supposed to be right here. And right there as it moves across the room. Uh, that's just assuming that your speakers are where Dolby it's told supposed you to be. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So if we don't know exactly where the speakers are, we're just taking an assumption that they're in the right spot. And they're not, you know, they're, you know, not very often do they go where they're supposed to go. They go where they can go in a lot of home environments. So by knowing what angle, you know, are they too far apart, too close together? Are they, you know, straight above or out forward? That allows our processor to map that little piece of metadata, that helicopter flying across the room more accurately. Because mm -hmm. we, know, we know where the sound playback is in the room, and we can just map that sound by knowing the angles and the height of everything that's that's in the room. So that's all part of YPOW as you progress up the line. Wow, you're yeah. making YPOW actually sound awesome. Yeah. <laughs> What's, I was trying to share. Heck? I didn't a... even know about that. I swear to you, I had no idea about the different mics. I didn't yeah, know about yeah. Did you guys know about this? Uh, Chana, did you know about that? Michael, hmm. did you know about Is what this all what the stuff that he's talking about here? or not? Yeah, that's it right yeah, there. Yeah, that, that's the thing right there. You knew about this? No, I mean. I did not. Mm -mm. So you would actually place it on the top and measure and then on yep. each and one then, of these boomerangs? Yeah, so the, 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 the horizontal ones, that's your angle adjustment. Okay. And then that fourth one, that gives you your, your height adjustment. Because we uh, reference nice. them all together. So we know where position one is and then mm -hmm. position two. We know that the time difference between it when we do a test tone. Um, you know, how long does it take the wave to travel across the room? I right. hit this mic and then this mic. And then uh, that's actually, um, you know, if you... You know, I talked about jazz clubs and uh, DSP earlier on with two channel stuff mm -hmm. where Yamaha actually has gone around the world and measured world famous performance venues, concert halls and clubs and uh, any type of performance venue. And th this was the breakthrough back in the 80s. Uh, there was actually several manufacturers trying to do this, but Yamaha was actually able to punch through with this. Cool. We had something very similar to that microphone system. It's called a single point quad microphone. So it was four microphones in a triangle. So one, two, three, four. And so they'd set off an impulse in a uh, concert hall. They could measure the reflections and reverberations from every single angle of the room. So today, here we are 30 some years later, and we're putting this super high tech thing that changed the whole industry. And we're putting that into an AV receiver now. So hmm. it's just, you know, things. So now, Derek, now Derek's got to go back and redo his whole calibration because he didn't. Work. <laughs> Look at that! Look so, at that! The, so let's talk real quickly about the the new stuff that you announced not that long ago. Yeah, like the, the R, is that the, the RX V6A? line? RX V six A, right? And yeah, the four A. Yeah, RX V and four, six and RX V four. And so, uh, yeah, you know, they're replacements uh, to add to the middle of the line. They're uh, Five ninety nine and four ninety nine. I think you'll see it online. Correct me if I'm wrong. Pull it up. <laughs> I'll pull it up. Yeah, yeah. And these are uh, replacement. And when you look at them, they are different looking than what we've done in the past. <clears throat> um, about every historically, about every ten years, we do a, a remake mm. or we do of our entire uh, receiver lineup. And <clears throat> you know the reason for that is it has to get better. So you come out with a new platform, you build your power supplies, you build a new video board layout that you're going to use for a while, the custom stuff for the zone two and zone three, you build that all structure the way you like. And then every year you evolve it. You add more things to it. You add better processing. You add uh, more key features or something like that. Uh, but after about seven, eight, nine, ten years, uh, it gets really hard to keep modifying right. things platform and it just it just comes to a point uh you know i was telling someone earlier today it's like uh doing a room addition on your house okay you move in the house you live there a while have a couple of kids you do a room addition 
You know, then you do another room addition. Then you do another room addition. You know, and after you know six or seven room additions to that original little house, uh, it probably is time to like go Switch buy another, <laughs> another piece of property and and start from scratch. And then we can start building on that. So it's kind of that same same mindset there. Yeah. So this is uh this is what it looks like. This is uh, the V four. The four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and this they, is the five channel one. Yeah. This is a five channel. Uh, it's Wi-Fi, it's, it's music cast. So it's part of our multi-room audio ecosystem. And one of the things that we did is we wanted to try to soften the black box look, you know, if you look, and even when I'm watching movies online, I see an AV receiver in the background. Um, sometimes I have to look and sometimes I don't catch it on the first glance of what brand it is. Even you know, thinking, hey, that almost looks like mine. And then the, you know, and then the, the shot goes away. But especially, you know, when you see stuff, how different do we all look? You know, it's yeah. a knob here, a knob here, a power button there, and it's black. You know, that's that's there. That's kind of the way the industry has been. So, what we want to do is, is change things up a little bit. And it, it was time for a rework anyway. So now the time is good. You know, with the popularity of sound bars, and one of the the things that's really important in sound bars is the uh, industrial design or the the cosmetics of it. Uh, we do a lot of uh, <clears throat> consumer studies where we go into people's homes and, you know, you think, okay, just, it's a long bar. It's got edges and buttons on it. Just throw it on the, the, the counter. Uh, no, consumers really look into that and they have real strong feelings uh, about the way things look. Mm -hmm. A black box doesn't make uh, a lot of people happy. I hate to say that because I'm, you know, it makes me happy. I love black boxes. That's how I've made my career. But you know, silver box. Yeah, silver. So, yeah. yeah, we've had titanium and we've had champagne and we've had silver. But you know, it's it's a way of softening it up, uh, make it a little more modern looking. Uh, we find that most people don't touch the front of the receiver very and if they do, it's very seldom. Mm -hmm. And when they're going to the receiver, it's for the volume <laughs> to mm -hmm. grab it down really quick. So we put that there. Uh, we took all the buttons off it. So there's soft touch buttons on the right hand side. There's a, those scene functions. Uh, right. reset, and then there's a jog shuttle that's on there. But when the unit is off, uh, it's just a nice clean. The display is built in. You can't see what's behind that. The display looks a little bit smaller is because it doesn't go all the way across the front of the receiver. So right. mm -hmm. um, what happens now is when you change a function, uh, it takes up that whole window. Gotcha. So it's actually, yeah, gotcha. The, the text and everything is way bigger than it had been in the previous 10 years of, of uh, last design. So it's actually easier to read from across the room. So when you change in a function, they'll change and in the first second, I'll go back down. Yeah. Very cool. So, and I'm assuming <laughs> we've got probably some Isn't this a black box? <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> I saw that. I was just like, yeah, no, <laughs> it is. And, and these are still AB, right? Yeah. Like you said yeah. earlier. Okay. Yeah. That this was a right. question in there too. Uh, yeah. So you see the Y power, the calibration mic that's in there. Uh, mm -hmm. This the, the entry piece uh, for the for the new series again. It's Wi-Fi. It's network. It's all your streaming services. It's voice control. What you know with all it's compatible with Siri and, and Amazon and Google and um, it does a, a scary amount of stuff for the the price. Uh, it probably was less than you know, eight years ago that this this is doing stuff that we had on our high end piece. All right. That's finally trickled back. You know, trickled down to this level. Yeah. So tell me the Send me the one with the wipeout with all the different mics. That's the one I want. Um, I heard is there any truth to this question here or this comment? Wipeout only down, uh, do, does EQ only down to 30 hertz? Yeah, it's actually, it's actually 31 and a half. And then uh, until you go up to the advanced, and then we'll drop, you can drop down another octave. Uh, in the, I in see. The, in the 20, 2080 and 3080. I think the 1080 might be able to go down there, but I know the top two models and the separates will come down to 15. Okay. Got it. So see? it all comes down to which which model you get. Yeah. Right? It all, it all depends yeah. on you know what your needs are. As the more you pay, the better it is. Surprise, surprise, ladies yeah, and gentlemen. Yeah. Well, but think about the even the opposite of that. Somebody that necessarily doesn't need all those features That's or true. doesn't care about all those yeah. features. They're it, like, it, I don't want to pay for something I don't need or I don't, you know, I'm not gonna use. So maybe for them, it's better to have that cost savings in a, you know, entry level, very affordable. There's Definitely true. Yeah. Models. Pretty much anybody can 
can afford it. 600 bucks, 400 bucks. That's awesome. Yeah. It, you know, and like this one right here, you know, we could take out Dolby Atmos and DTSX and give them an EQ down to 15 Hertz. Mm. But I think for the $600 customer, they'd probably, they probably want that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. They probably, I but, mean, that, that's the guess that, you know, that's the research that we do uh, mm -hmm. to, to come up with this. We don't just go, well, this costs too much. Let's take a few of the, you're not, you're not just throwing components on a wall and be like, yeah, which one are we yeah. going to keep? Hey, oh, Kro yeah. Kro like has some tough questions here for you, but I think they're legitimate. Uh -oh. All right. Go for it. Do you see some of those Chana? He's asking about the uh, web UI. Web, well, he's also asking about the shielding and the, you know, oh, yeah. oh, uh, here. how oh, uh, okay. uh, stuff was separate before. And it isn't now. I don't think this one was a serious. It was question. a while back, actually. <laughs> How many flux capacitors on that thing? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, UL. Uh, I think we use the Canada. Uh, see, it's not on that. That's a generic back panel that's on there. Uh, I'm not sure we use at UL anymore, and it's hard to tell from the pictures on the website. Well, uh, I, I chose this yeah, picture because this is the 6A, which has three HDMI 2.1 ports. Yeah, but if you look, it's a generic one. It doesn't. Oh, have it is. It doesn't have oh, a model. Okay. Uh, we get this artwork um, months before the product because we have to build. My department actually builds some web pages mm -hmm. that go up there, so we're building stuff uh, months before the product and photography and all that stuff is even available. So a lot of right. times we'll get generic images, not for the individual market. I got you. Did so, you find it, Mike? There, the base management. Yeah, not. Uh, I looked through a bunch. Of yeah, it was a while back. I think he was just saying that um, uh, before you used to have uh something separated out, and it's no longer set up that way. For the base. Um, I'm trying to find it. It's it was pretty far yeah. back, I guess. Croson, if you could repost that. Yeah, clip. I think it was maybe something to do with the power supply or something about shielding. I, it was kind of. Coming through kind of quick, so I missed it. Well, while we're waiting on his, I got another question for you. And this one I just kind of thought of uh, earlier, even uh, before we got on the show, is kind of kind of walk us through, like, why does it take manufacturers so long to implement kind of some newer technologies? You know, we got the 4K 120. Oh, yeah. And, you know, in regards to that, maybe kind of walk us through, what is Yamaha? Like, what does your process look like in regards to that and embracing these new technologies? <laughs> how, much we, how much time we have? <laughs> it can be short and sweet. Just kind of, just like uh, I, I thought it was really fascinating. So that's why I wanted to kind uh, of that to the yeah, show. Yeah, it, it is. There, there's so much that goes on uh, behind the scenes. So, um, so the new receivers that we look at, the V4K 120 and, and all the gaming features and stuff like that. Uh, when we start designing these, we have to project where the market's going to be, what the market demands going to be. You know, is it going to be 4K? Is it going to be 3D video? I guess not. We kind of made a wrong turn there. <laughs> it was, um, the whole industry went that direction, and uh, now we're not. So uh, we have to figure out where we're going to be and what technologies are going to be available. And then just because a technology is available doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be chips available to implement that technology. Okay. So uh, – for video, for instance, you got the HDMI.org. So that's the, the working group that builds all the HDMI protocols and things like that. So they build a protocol for HDMI 2.1, for instance. So it's got uh, capabilities of doing this, you know, so much bandwidth, channels, you know, all the things that go along with it. There's tons of stuff that don't even get implemented that are part of, part of this. So once they build a specification, then they build a, uh, uh, basically it's a, manual of how what specs what does this in the all the bit streams what bit does this and i mean it's it's very very detailed instruction manual on how to implement hdmi 2.1 well at the same time they're building that the ic manufacturers are trying to build chips to do that same thing and then the av receiver company or the the chip manufacturer had to be flexible enough to be able to do that thing uh, and then manufacturers get to do the programming to make that chip do its thing to match the, the, spec. You know, the, the spec that's in there. HDMI has been kind of notorious because 
Uh, I, I don't envy them. They do just a spectacular job from you know where we were five years ago, 10 years ago to where we are today. Uh, with, you know, um, but they're always kind of behind. Whenever there's a big jump in HDMI technology, uh, they build the recipe book and everyone starts building product to it. But usually what follows and always seems to lag is the testing certification okay. uh, parameters. And we can build a product at Yamaha and it follows every single recipe, you know, pages and pages. It follows it all perfect. Right. Mm -hmm. But you can't certify it just because we say, yeah, we followed the recipe. We did everything that you said in the book. So, you know, give us the certification. Uh, it doesn't work that way. So you have to wait until the certification uh, manual comes out. Mm -hmm. Then you run your, te your, your, your product through that. And that's just for HDMI. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, we're talking about, you know, some of the cool things with, you know, the 4K 120s, all the gaming, you know, right. variable right. pressure and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the standard, the testing standard has not been finalized yet. Okay. We're looking uh. about December uh, before everyone's building stuff that they think is going to work with it. And that's, that's, that's actually. Yeah. Really Did you hear that, everybody? <laughs> Did you hear that? I, I have this video, yeah. Phil. It's got over 200,000 views and it's telling people not to upgrade their TV for the next gen consoles because mm. we just don't know what's happening. You don't. Perfect perfect example. You just mentioned it. The testing protocols aren't out until December. It's not completed yet. Yeah. 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 So how are you going to know? So if you're watching out there and you want to upgrade for these consoles, wait. Just put on the brakes. I know. I know you want to buy something. I want to buy something too. <laughs> but just wait. Just wait. That's going to be your best bet. Um you know, big, big thing with, the, I had the Samsung Q90T, regular mm -hmm. price, $1,800 for a 55 inch. You can get on sale for $1,500. One HDMI port. They put it as HDMI 4. However, so, so you get one console, you're good, right? right? However, you get a Yamaha V6A. It's got three HDMI 2.1 mm -hmm. inputs. You get your PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X. Custom made gaming PC with a 3090 or whatever yeah. video card is, mm -hmm. and you plug it in to the HDMI 4 on the TV, but HDMI 3 is the ARC port, so you can't get any audio from the TV oh, to the really? AVR. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, big, big. I think it's a big blunder, you know. I think, uh, you know, in, in this stage of like, well, this TV's got one, this TV's got two, this TV's got four. You're better off with the four HDMI 2.1 port TVs right now. Yeah, until... you think so? Yeah. yeah. Well, yes, exactly. You would think so because the testing uh, protocols are not out yeah. yet, so you're yeah, still the, up in the air. Yeah, the testing uh, to uh, to be totally accurate, the testing for a repeater is not done. I don't know about the sources, okay. and things, but uh, repeater is a you know an AV receiver. If it's got a pass through receiver, that's the repeater. That testing, I, that's the the part I know is not finalized. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing on either end, but you know, there's there's two ways of going about it. Is you can build stuff that you think is going to work. You built it to the to the spec to the rules, um, and then if it doesn't test out, you can fix it in firmware later on. You hope. Sometimes you know, most of the time you can, but I've seen situations where you can't fix it with firmware uh, when you come out a little bit early. Um, mm -hmm. What Yamaha is uh, is doing. We have a very flexible. Um, base, uh, the, the circuitry, uh, the capability of it is really flexible. So we, we build it to what we think it is. We're waiting for the protocol to come out. Then we'll, yeah. shove, then we'll shove the uh, software into it to program, make it do it. And so it's, make it do it right is, uh, you know, we want it done right the first time. So it's probably a kind of a risk to some manufacturers that kind of, you know, want to be out there and be the first to have this implemented. And maybe I'm kind of hearing Yamaha's approach is like, hey, we're going to prepare for it, but we're also going to be ready to make some adjustments when we, we get that testing protocol and can make sure that, you know, this thing's going to work great in, in the hands of consumers. Yeah, it, it seems like it's a hard decision to make. Uh, for us, it's not. Yamaha is a very conservative company. Uh, our reputation, our sound quality, you know, everything that we do yeah. uh, has to be done right. So uh, we, we will sacrifice uh, speed to market for mm quality, usability, or you know, whatever we're, we're trying to achieve. Um, most of the time, we don't have to delay anything. Most of the time, things come out. But when there's huge changes like this, and there's 
protocols that aren't even testing protocols aren't even finalized yet, mm -hmm. uh, then we hold off on stuff and make sure it's done right for our customers. Yeah. What what technology? What new technology when it comes to audio are you most excited about? Oh my goodness! Uh, oh, um, you know probably uh, it, you know speaking of the, of the V6, the RX V6 is they got the the Dolby height virtualization. Uh, I think that is spectacular, and we've heard that before. We've heard demos of it, and you know especially in that midline uh, price, you know overhead speakers are not happening very often. You know to be honest. Uh, maybe you've got Dolby enabled speakers and trying to bounce off the ceiling and stuff like that. That happens sometimes too. But with a Dolby height virtualizer, you can take the metadata from the Dolby Atmos bitstream. You know, and everyone's doing it now. It's a uh, Apple. What is it? Uh, Apple and uh, Roku and Hulu. I, there's a whole list of people that are 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 uh, streaming Jumping on that. Yeah, are, are streaming the Atmos. And oh yeah, yeah, they're they're streaming Atmos, yeah. Yeah, they're streaming Atmos, and if you run into a five-channel receiver or seven-channel receiver without Atmos speakers, you just lost the whole thing. So the, the height virtualizer, the virtualization, will grab that metadata and virtualize that, mm. not virtualize the 7.1 soundtrack and kind of fake where everything's going to go. Mm -hmm. It takes just what is supposed to go overhead, and then it just has to virtualize that. When you do a virtual surround, uh, it's real easy to do small things or individual things. If you're trying to do a virtual 7.1 soundbar, it doesn't get real discreet. You know, you can make it bigger and stuff like that, but it's not really discreet surround. But if I take a pair of speakers and do a virtual surround back, and we have some processes in some of our receivers that do that. It's called virtual surround back. <laughs> Yeah, 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 right. yeah. yeah very, very clever name. Yeah. Uh, and all we're doing is we're using front present speakers to virtualize the surround back. It doesn't care about oh, the okay. surround, the So it's just trying to give you a uh, psychoacoustic effect of the sound coming behind. And it works because it only has to do one thing. And we can um, make the processing algorithm specific to that and give us this, the sound that's off the bat. So with it, getting back to the Dolby height virtualization, they're using that metadata for the object-based sounds that are moving around the room, and they're just doing that. We're letting your 5.1 system do the 5.1, and we're just going to throw some overhead with a little bit of virtualization. So uh, it's really cool. It's a it's a neat thing. It's extremely practical for this price point right here. You know, especially, you know maybe not for a three thousand dollar receiver. Yeah, it'll still mostly it'll be in there in our three thousand dollar receivers. But you know you're going to have speakers and stuff. And you've heard it, and it sounds. Uh, convincing from what you've heard yes, yes. Huh. it works Very good cool. it's really cool it's really cool yeah i've heard some stuff that that works and some stuff that doesn't work so well so maybe it might also be room dependent dependent too yeah it could and yeah. it, depends, it depends how uh, the processor is dialed in you know with the with the rest of the system but it gives you know someone you know with a medium price system it gives them something better than they would have had and since they got out, when you see, when you're picking a movie out and it says Dolby Atmos, a little banner on the left-hand corner of the, the thumbnail there, you want that. But if your receiver can't do it, then you'd be, oh, man, I don't have that. I don't have that. Uh, but the receivers are capable of it, so let's just give it the virtual virtualization that's in there. That's nice. That's, right. that's nice. That's all um, I got. Any, uh, any plans for Oro 3D? Uh, that's another one that we're looking at. And that's, oh, really? Uh, I th I thought that was going to be a flat out hard uh, yeah. pass. I that's totally awesome. thought that was going to yeah. be a hard pass. Uh, you surprised me, Phil. Yeah, yeah well, I don't. Don't let me back up so I don't get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, d don't hold don't hold your breath for it. But okay. that's another technology mm -hmm. that the hardware is most likely capable of mm -hmm. um, that can be thrown in there. And that's again, that's popularity. You know, in Europe. There's more of a demand for it than we have over here. Yeah. Um, and so we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah. The last time I, uh, the last time, the one time I talked to, what is, how does he say his name? Is it Will, Willifred? Willifred, the inventor? Uh, we were on this long call a couple of years ago and he was thinking, or he, or he was trying to implement Oro 3D uh, streaming 
on certain platforms. Mm. So that would that would totally open things up. Yeah, that would open that would open the door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm an idiot. I just went and bought the movies from like France and Germany and and Got England. A good deal. <laughs> no, they're like fifty dollars and yeah, they're, they're standard Blu rays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotta wait like three weeks for them to arrive. But um, man, with that Voice of God channel, this is pretty cool effects. Pretty it cool is. Effects. It is. Yeah. It's really, really cool. It's always better to have speakers where you want the sound to come from. At the end yeah. of the day, I think. Right? I think so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you can, but I think that if you if don't you have that, I think that's a great option for people that have that weird shape room. They can't get speakers to the back, or they've got you know, the issues are running cables and they're like, I got hardwood floors. How do I get them back there? Or maybe I live in an apartment. I can't get sound. You know, I can't put holes in my ceiling kind of deal. So being able to have those options, I think that's always a good thing. Yeah. And that, you know, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't even mention that. I, I mentioned that it was music cast and these two entry level receivers. So they do our wireless multi-room audio, but that also makes them, um, uh, compatible with our wireless surround, so I can get two MusicCast speakers uh, and put them in the back of the room, and I can run wireless surrounds to that through. Our oh room. no way! Yeah, yeah. I, I did yeah. that with the um, twenty eighty. I won yeah. one of those uh, MusicCast speakers at CES, and then yeah. uh, and then I asked you guys to send me another one so I could try it, and it worked. It worked. You have to plug yeah. it into power, of course. Yeah, right, right. Uh, yeah, it's um, pretty cool. Yeah. For your 20, 2080, uh, maybe it gets used, but maybe not. Probably but not. if you're an apartment dweller, you're living in a condo, you know, you're you're living somewhere, you can't run speakers mm -hmm. back. You got a mid midline receiver, entry level receiver, you got an option now. Something's better than nothing. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, any plans to change out to Durac? Uh not that I know of. That would, I would, wouldn't that kind of be shooting yourself in the foot if like you're uh, if you've got YPAL and that's your kind of baby yeah, yeah and, that's what I would know, think we, there's still stuff we can do with YPAL I mean we're not done developing that mm -hmm. you know, every year we, we're getting better the processing capability is getting so phenomenal now of what we can do um, and since it's so uh, intertwined with the rest of our DSP processing uh, mm -hmm. whether it's DSP or YPOW volume and all that stuff. Yeah. The YPOW data goes out throughout the whole processing chipset. It's a stack of data that gets used in a bunch of different places. And if you change that whole thing. It's uh, like a re whole revamp. Yeah, then you're, yeah. you're starting from scratch. I wonder if there's any truth to that. The, what, what we heard about uh, Ankyo and, and Pioneer, right? They said that supposedly that they're going to start implementing direct yeah, so that, that's why i think that's where the question comes from mm -hmm. oh okay is, yeah. uh, i heard we, we heard last Rumors. time that, that might be a possibility that uh now that they're uh you know some stuff is changing over there right. that yeah. they might be implementing but yeah i'm i'm curious i i still want to see if white pal is good you know it's good i, I want to know that. if it's good so i'll let you guys out there know if it's good um the new stuff so maybe you guys let me try the different levels, right? Yeah, there you go. Because yes. you know, if you there's different levels. There's different so levels. that's that's a little bit different. I think uh, Denon and Morantz they also have different levels on they their do. Odyssey, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So they don't give you everything on their lowest uh, uh, on their budget models. <laughs> yep. You kind of have to step up to the higher end stuff to access all that as well. And yeah. honestly, even Direct does the same thing. Yeah, yeah, they, they do. But, yeah. You, but you pay big money for that. Yeah. 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 Because the amount of processing horsepower it takes to do mm. the highest level. That makes sense. You, you couldn't put it in an entry level or mid level receiver. Yeah. I mean, it, it has to go in a $3,000 or $2,500 mm. receiver. Makes sense. Just, that's, the only place, that's the only place it can, it can fit. Well, Direct yeah. does it so the, the, it has the hardware, but you just have to pay the, what, 99 yeah. bucks, Michael, to unlock the rest? Uh, $499. Four, yeah. <laughs> $499 to unlock yeah. the rest. $499 you can do to it. get. Base it's not control. gonna let you. You could do it or yeah. buy another receiver. One. <laughs> three, it's three, three forty nine and four ninety nine, depending on which which level you want. Yeah, damn. Yeah, so you got okay. You, you know, you want, you want although, one subwoofer? Or where, where was I? I was at. Uh, oh, I was CES, and it was. At, I think. Um, I think it was the screen guy was doing a room, but it was a. Um, it was an audio control um, preamp processor okay. and dyn audio 5.2 nice. 
holy crap like it was they i watched like two things and one of them was the helicopter scene in um the helicopter chase in mission impossible the okay. newer newest newer one yeah. Whew, man that sounded 3d that 5.1 like sounded 3d it was uh, it was running dirac but um yeah, I was like, so uh, what are these components? He's like, oh, the pre pro is 10,000, the amplifier is 12,000. Yeah. And I'm like, how many speakers are we running? He's like, 5.2. <laughs> I know. Cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what? What? So, yeah, there are, there are different levels. And, uh, you know, hopefully one day I will be able to afford all of them. You got to, you know what? Ma Yamaha mar marketing guys, you got to start sending stuff out to us, YouTube reviewers, because like, you know, we just don't know about this stuff. So You're I've said know. it before. I, I'm saying I told know. Phil You're behind the know. scenes, you guys, whoever's in charge, you guys got to send us stuff so we know about it. Yeah, we don't have to keep. We'll send it right back to you. It's fine. Yeah. You know what I mean? Don't worry about that. But we need yeah. to know about the stuff in order to so be able to talk about it. So people, people ask us, and then we're just like, we just I don't, don't know. know. We'll yeah. fix you guys up. Because I know Joe, I didn't know Joe was so adamant about it. But every time I talked to him, he goes, "Hey Phil, before we get into what I want to talk about, hey, you know that new receiver? I'd be really nice if I had one to review." <laughs> so, yeah. Every one of your conversations starts with that, and yeah, you it's got, just that it's just a new way of doing yeah, things, right? Yeah. Just send it out yeah. to us, have us yeah. check it out, you know, just so we know about it. You know, yeah. I'm assuming anything that Yamaha does is not going to be terrible, you know. No. I'm pretty sure it's going to be okay. Yeah. I just I don't know about it, so it's yeah. hard to talk about it. But I didn't know about the the different uh, versions of Wipeout. Yeah. I thought it was all, all kind of just the same thing. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, so. and, you know, we want to get the product in front of uh, your audience too. I mean, the guys that are listening today these are these are the industry. I mean, if, yeah, if yeah. it wasn't for these kinds of guys and gals that are listening today, uh, we if no one was tuning in, that would be a bad sign. <laughs> <laughs> that means that what we're doing is irrelevant but uh what we're doing is is really cool so we want uh, to spread the word and get it out there <laughs> yeah well i want to thank all the people who did tune in yeah we have you know hovering like near 100 people uh just all watching oh, so thanks. thank you for tuning in yeah. and, and checking this out and and participating yeah the whole crew's so. here rga cruising rsx you know, Jeff, John, uh, everybody, Kanga. Uh, there's too many to name. Paul, yeah. oh, no, that's Croson, Portofino, or no, Por Porfirio. I can't mm -hmm. even read. It's ridiculous. Hey, great <laughs> questions tonight, too. So, yeah, good, good discussion. Yeah, that's good. Still definitely enjoyed having you on the show again. Good. Let's do it again. Yeah. yeah see you at the Hi Fi Summit. We'll be there. October. We'll be there looking forward to it. Yeah. yeah and don't, yeah, don't hit that leave studio button just now, Phil. We'll, 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 we'll end just hang out. Stick just around for out. a second. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to the Daily High Five podcast. Uh, we do this every Monday, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Make sure you are subscribed up to the Daily High Five YouTube channel so you get all the alerts. Yeah. And definitely check out the High Five Summit ticket page as the early bird tickets are going to be going off sale soon. Get it while they're hot, right? That's 25 fun. bucks for five days. That's not bad. Not bad at all. On behalf of Mike and Joe and Phil from Yamaha, see you guys next time. Peace.